Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening service. Uh, I'm really looking forward to being back next week in person at church. So this will be the last time we live stream in the evening, though we'll continue our morning live stream. So we are looking forward to seeing all of you back next week. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're going to complete kind of a, a mini series within a series of the spiritual gifts. I've slowed down particularly on certain gifts because they require a little bit more care. And this evening we're going to do primarily with tongues, and then we're going to look at uh, more briefly discerning of the Spirit. So I want you to join with me as we read from Scripture 1 Corinthians 13, and we're going to read from verses 8 to 11, but we're really going to pick up from verse 10c to 11. To one there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and still to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and same Spirit and he gives them to each one just as he determines. This is God's word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which you have given us insight into the way you gift us spiritually. And we thank you that for every single Christian, they, they have spiritual gifts that you give to them as you sovereignly determine. We thank you for the variety of the spiritual gifts. And we thank you for the way that they, you, they can be used to build up your people. We pray that you would help us to understand the gifts this evening as we look at tongues and distinguishing of spirits. We pray that you would give us insight and we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to learn something new and to also be able to distinguish what gifts you have given us. Help us to be able to go through these lists of gifts and work out if any of them apply to us. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. I want to begin with a story that speaks about one of the difficulties that there has been with this whole spiritual gift of tongues. It's a, given by a well-known pastor who was sent to a charismatic Sunday school literature that he designed to teach kindergarten children to speak in tongues. It's titled, I've Been Filled with the Holy Spirit. And is an eight-page coloring-in book. One page has a caricature of a smiling weightlifter with a T-shirt that says, Spirit Man. Under him is printed 1 Corinthians 14.4. He that speaks in an unknown tongue builds himself up. Another page features a boy who looks like Howdy Doody with his hands lifted up. A dotted line outline pictures where his lungs would be. This is evidently represents the spirit a cartoon uh, in the lung-shaped diagram is printed Ba le doma ta la se ta na ma. A cartoon-style balloon from his mouth repeats the words Ba le doma ta la se ta na ma. A brain-shaped cloud is drawn in his head with a large question mark in the cloud. Also inside the cloud is printed My mind doesn't understand what I'm saying. Under the boy. 1 Corinthians 14, 14 is printed. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, some of those kinds of ideas about tongues, this very controversial gift, have surfaced uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. And with the revival, in a sense, if we go back historically, somewhere in the 60s, uh, not of so much Pentecostalism, but rather of the charismatic movement, tongues became a very, very prominent feature within that movement. And as a result of that, there was a certain level of confusion regarding tongues. Does tongues involve speaking in an ecstatic language that is not understood or by anyone else, but understood by God? Is tongues a private prayer language? Is tongues the language of angels? 
and so on. And, and, and because of these difficulties, what began to happen within the charismatic movement, and I'm not having a go at the charismatic movement, I'm just giving you information of what occurred in that movement, is that tongues became a regular feature of church services. So there would be a time where there would be opportunity given for people to speak in tongues, and then the entire congregation, or at least many within the congregation, and I've been in services where this has occurred, would then begin to speak in tongues, and then after a certain amount of time, the pastor would quieten them down, and they would continue their service. And tongues was understood primarily as an ecstatic language that is spoken between man and God, a kind of prayer language that excludes Satan from understanding what's being said, and only God can understand what's being said. And so that became quite popular, and then it became almost a badge of admittance into having a fuller experience of the Holy Spirit if you spoke in tongues. So you receive the Holy Spirit at conversion, and then a little bit later, you have a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that baptism of the Holy Spirit, where you receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then evidences itself in those people speaking tongues. So tongues then became a kind of sign that somehow you had graduated from not really having the fullness of the Spirit to now having the fullness of the Spirit. And so tongues operated in that kind of way. And the question we need to ask ourselves this evening, is that what Scripture says? Is that how tongues is meant to function? Well, there are three possibilities to this particular spiritual gift. First possibility is that it is a simply a human language, a known human language. Second possibility is that it is the language of angels. So here we are speaking about um, a coded language that is a language that has the same kind of a structure is a language, but it's not a known language in the world, but it has the code of a language, but is in the language of angels and only God understands it. And of course, the third way of understanding tongues is that it is an ecstatic language. And in this understanding, tongues doesn't have any kind of grammatical form, doesn't have any kind of known uh, structure to it. It's just a completely unknown language and that is spoken between man and God. Now, I want to take a look at that a little bit more in detail so we can understand what it, it means and to understand why that is probably not what is going on here in 1 Corinthians. Um, now, when we talk about it being ecstatic language, we talk about it being incomprehensible to anyone, which is why if you've been to one of these services, and I've been to a few, and tongues breaks out, you, you, it just sounds like mumbo-jumbo because you don't understand it, and only God supposedly is understand. Now, the reason why this is important is because in the Corinthian situation, many of the converts had come from pagan religions into the church. And whether or not you're aware of this, tongues actually functions within some paganism, which in, within some pagan religions. And so this kind of ecstatic speaking in an unknown language was not uncommon for the Corinthians. They would have seen it, they would have heard it, some of them would have experienced it prior to them being converted. And so they've come out of that kind of setting into the church, and for some of them it's kind of a, a just a transporting of that experience as pagans into the church context. Um, and that kind of tongues would have been, by those who had been converted out of that, advocated within the Corinthian context. And so this, this kind of ecstatic private language that only God understands and is speaking, be, spoken between us and God would have been uh, common back then in their particular situation. 
Now, even within that spectrum, so if we take that ecstatic language, that unknown language, and we then begin to broaden it out a little bit within uh, certain charismatic circles, there seems to be a certain level of confusion even as to how that functions. So for some, it's a missionary gift. For some, it's the language of angels. For some, it's a communication between God and man. For some, it's a sign that you've been filled with the Spirit. So even within that, those circles, there's a fair bit of confusion as what it means. Now, when we take the word for tongues in the original language, it has various meanings. But none of those meanings really help for it. It's most commonly used of the tongue the physical tongue, this thing, and then sometimes, or, or the next most common use is it is used of languages. Those are the, the most common uses, and, and sometimes it's used metaphorically, so that it talks about tongues of fire coming down on people. Those are the uses, so it doesn't really give us much help in terms of understanding what it is. Um, the problem with it being an ecstatic language, however, is that would go against the way in which the word is most commonly used in Scripture, which is to designate a known human language. And the other difficulty, I think, that arises out of that, when we examine what the gifts are intended to do, and we looked at this earlier in the gifts, they are meant for mutual edification. So if we are going to mutually edify one another, then we need to exercise gifts that have some benefit for the entire body of Christ. And when you have a whole group of people speaking in tongues together, they may be edified, but the body is not edified within that particular context. And so if it is a, a, a gift like this, then it certainly is not going to be beneficial for the wider body. Coupled to that, I think one of the dangers of going down that route, and I've seen this firsthand, I'll relate an experience that I had for you uh, firsthand in this, is that tongues is often within those circles a learned thing that you do. I went to a particular church when I was doing an evaluation of worship services when I was in my uh, third year at college, and uh, we were looking at how churches did worship, and I went to a particular well-known charismatic church in South Africa. At the end of that service, they invited people to come to the back, and if they wanted to speak in tongues, they would teach them how to speak in tongues. And so what happened is a group of people came. I went to the man who was in charge, and I said, look, I'm doing a college assignment. I'm at the Baptist Theological College. Do you mind if I just sit in and observe? I'm not going to say anything and take some notes. And he said, yes, that's fine. You, 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 you can do that. So I sat right at the back, and there were about six or seven people up on the stage. And they invited those up who wanted to speak in tongues. This was in a back room behind the main auditorium. And as those people came up, basically it went like this. The person leading them would say, I want you to speak the words that I'm going to speak. Just follow these words, and as you speak in the similar way to what I speak, you will begin then, the Holy Spirit will take over, and tongues will begin to come out. And so they would stand up there and they would start speaking in this language and encouraging the person to say the same words. Some people uh, participated, others just looked confused and weren't sure what to do. But it was a, a learned tongues that they were being taught. And for some, walked off that stage no better than, than they went, when they went up. And others came away having learned how to say those words. Now, if tongues is a gift from the Spirit, and tongues is something that the Holy Spirit comes upon us and spontaneously enables us to do, then it's not something we learn from another person. It is something supernaturally given to us by God and then used for His glory and the edification of the saints, not given or taught to us by someone else. So it seems unlikely that this is what's going on. Uh, on here in the Rome, uh, Corinthian context. Now, secondly, there are those who say that tongues is a cognitive language, so it's a, a language, but an unknown language to us. It is a 
coded language, not known by humans. So it's, a, it's got structure to it. It's got a, a certain grammar to it. But it's just not a known language. Now, I've given a, a PowerPoint just to put up on the screen to try and show you how this looks. So let's take the phrase, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Now, have a look at what I've put up there, and we'll make some adjustments. We remove the vowels on the first line. So we have praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever minus the vowels. Then we remove the spaces, and beginning with the first letter, rewrite the sequence using every third letter, repeatedly going through the sequence until all the letters are used up with the following result. You can see the result there. I'm not going to try and read that. Finally, we add an A sound after each consonant and break up the sequence arbitrarily to end with Patara, Rama, Nasavahara, Dahara, Dafasala, Fasa, Karara. Now, if you've been to any tongue service, you will know that sounds quite similar to what I've heard in some tongue service. So, so that would be a, a kind of a coded language that is not understood by any human beings, but is a coded language between you and God. Now, that's possible it could be something like that, but I think there's a much better explanation. And I want to go to that third, that tongues is a known language. It is a known human language. When you go to Acts chapter 2, verse 6, and Acts chapter 2, verse 8 and 11, let me uh, read those. Because we have the same word used in Acts that we have used in the Corinthian context. So let me just go to that quickly. Acts chapter 2. When they heard the sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Same word. Then that is how each of us hears them in his own native language, tongues, both Jews and converts to Jew Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Now, in the Acts situation, what you have is you have a, a group of people who have gathered. This, the sermon is being preached by the apostles, and all of those who are gathered there from different language groups hears the sermons in their own language. And those who are preaching them uh, are preaching in a language that is not native to them, but a language that is given to them by God, by the Holy Spirit, so that those who are there hear the gospel in their own language, and as a result, there is wonder and awe, and they are converted, and many are added to the kingdom of God. So when we take that and we understand what's going on in Acts, and we use that as a, as a help to discover what's going on in Corinthian, recognizing that the same word is being used, we discover that the tongues that are spoken about in Corinthians is the supernatural coming of the Holy Spirit upon a person, giving them ability to speak a known human language that is unknown to them, so that whoever is present in the audience hears the gospel in their own language, and as a result of that, they are converted, and therefore the body of God. Christ is edified and built up. Now, this kind of phenomenon of tongues has occurred in missionary contexts particularly and also in other contexts. If I can try and illustrate this. Imagine, in fact, I'll illustrate it with my own experience of, of going to France. When Janice and I were in France back in 2013 on holiday, we got lost in Paris and we had a, a map that we were, had taken out and looking at on the street, trying to find our way to the accommodation that had been booked online. And it was a bit confusing for us because, can you believe it, the French put all their road signs in French. I mean, you think they could have put it in English so we could have understood, but no, they have to put it in French. And so there we are trying to read these French signs and trying to understand the names of the roads. And, and we had no idea, we had no uh, ability to speak French. And uh, while we were wrestling over this map, a French lady came and stopped and said to us, can I help you? And we said to her, which is the only phrase we really knew in French, polyvoo anglais, do you speak English? And she said, a little bit. 
And she began to speak to us and try and help us to get to the place that we wanted to go. Now imagine for a moment that that situation that we were in in France, we went to a church, and we were sitting in that church as native English speakers, and someone in that church who doesn't speak English stood up and began to speak in English to us, and we were unbelievers, and that had an impact upon us, and we were converted as a result, and that person then sits down, and then another person stands up and gives the interpretation in French to the French people who are in that service. Now everyone understands what's going on. Everyone is edified, and we have been, as a result of that, in some way affected for the kingdom of God. Now, that is the way that tongues works. And Paul speaks about this in chapter 14, where he says, you did not listen so that God spoke to you through foreign tongues. What does he mean? He means that the Israelites who were stubborn did not listen to their own prophets. And as a result of that, God took them into exile. And it was through foreign tongues that finally he disciplined them. And so when we speak about the gift of tongues, it is the supernatural ability to speak a language that you have never, ever learned, but a known language in this world, so that whenever it occurs, whoever is being spoken to in that language within the context of a service, a church service, they, are, they benefit from the word that is brought to them, and as a result, the body of Christ is edified. So tongues is not ultimately a difficult gift to understand. The interpretation of tongues then, it follows naturally that if that is how tongues functions, then the interpretation of tongues is when someone stands up and interprets what has gone on in the church. Because if we have a church service here and we have someone who has come to us from Russia, for example, and they don't understand any English, and someone who doesn't understand any Russian stands up and speaks uh, a word from God to them in Russian, none of us are going to understand what's happened. And then another person, or that same person, is given the ability to interpret that, and as a result of that, they bring the same message to us, but now in English, the whole body is edified within the church. And therefore, when we talk about tongues, it's simply the means by which that a known language uh, is, is, is presented and the interpretation of that is also given. What we must always bear in mind and always remember is it's important that the entire body is edified in this process. And the body can only be edified where there is interpretation of those tongues. So when you go to situations and you might happen to walk through the doors of the church and everyone is speaking in tongues or gets an opportunity during the service and there is no interpretation, there is not a biblical pattern occurring at that particular church. If we are going to stay true to the biblical pattern, and 1 Corinthians 14 will bring this out even more clearly, where there are tongues spoken, 1 Corinthians 14 says two, three at the most, one at a time, and then there is interpretation for all of those tongues. So tongues is never a corporate thing where everyone suddenly starts babbling out in tongues. It is always an individual thing, two, three at the most, one at a time, an interpretation every time of those tongues spoken in a known language, not known by the speaker, but known by someone in the audience who is there and they come under the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. So tongues and the interpretation of tongues is not that difficult. Okay, now I want to move on to uh, distinguishing between the spirits. Distinguishing between the spirits. Look at the, the last part of this. Different kinds of tongues. And still to another, to a passion, uh, sorry, the first part, to another distinguishing between spirits. What does he mean by that? Again, there are a number of different possibilities of this. But in view of 
the context and view of the way in which the spiritual gifts work, it is most likely the ability to distinguish between that which comes from God and that which comes from demons or that which comes from Satan. And it works its way out in four distinct ways, and I'm going to go through these quite quickly. First, those who are able to distinguish between spirits know the difference between those who perform true and false miracles. Now, in, even in the day in which we live, there have been many who have claimed certain miracles over the years. There was Rodney Howard Brown, I nearly said Rodney Howard the Clown, but Rodney Howard Brown, who spoke about gold teeth appearing in people and gold dust coming down from that church. What a church service to go to. You walk in with normal teeth, you walk out with gold teeth. Or you walk out with gold dust coming and you collect it and go and buy whatever you want to buy. But that happened back in the Toronto Blessing, for those of you who remember, claiming certain miracles. Now those who are able to distinguish between spirits will know that that is false, that doesn't come from God, and they will be able to discern that when it's happening. You see, one of the easy things for us to do is... 10 years down the line or five years down the line, when we've had a bit of time to do some evaluation, you and I might be able to step back and say, okay, now that we've seen this in operation for a while, now we've seen uh, and had a time to think about it and, and to go back to the scriptures and to work out whether it's true or false, we might then be able to conclude, yes, this is false. What makes it different for those who have the ability to distinguish between the spirits is they will recognize it when it happens, immediately. There won't be any delay for them being able to understand that. Now, remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So there are some who will claim to belong to God, claim to belong to Jesus, claim to do things in his name, yet are false. And these people who are gifted in this way will be able to identify that straight away. Matthew 24, 24. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect. If it was possible. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that these miracles and signs are going to look so genuine. They're going to look so good from the outside. They're going to be so spectacular that if it were possible, even those who are truly saved might get drawn into their deception. And those who are able to distinguish between spirits will recognize it for what it is immediately. Second, They are able to know the difference between those who preach true and false doctrine. And they will be able to distinguish that, again, straight away. Now, sometimes this is uh, one of those things where false prophets are not overtly false. You know, you've experienced this, where there are those who preach what seemingly seems to be the Bible. They speak a lot of truth from the Bible. And then here and there, they just mix in a little bit of error. And as they mix in that little bit of error, sometimes because they've been speaking a lot of truth, the error is missed by people, and they get sucked into those kinds of churches. Now, there are many out there. I've mentioned them before. You take someone like Benny Hinn or Kenneth Copeland, uh, there, there are many others who purport that are Joel Osteen, who, who speak a, a, a lot of truth from the Word of God, but then introduce just a little bit of errors. Now, those who are able to distinguish between spirits will distinguish that straight away. They will know that what is being preached is false, and they will identify it. Now, Peter talks about this. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, listen to Peter. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. Hear what he's saying. He's not saying false teachers and false prophets outside. He's saying false teachers and false prophets inside the church. That's the danger. Now, let me keep going. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, health, wealth, 
and even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their shameful ways and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. Now those who are gifted in distinguishing between spirits will understand the falseness of what is being preached when it is being preached, and they will make that call immediately. Jude 1, verse 4. For certain men whose condemnation was written about long ago, listen, have secretly slipped in among you. And I think it's really, really important to understand that these are not external people. These are people from within the body of Christ who have slipped in among you. They are godless men who change the grace of our God into license for immorality and deny Jesus Christ only sovereign and Lord. So here they are flaunting the grace of God in ways that are inconsistent with the grace of God. And they're leading people astray with them down those same paths of immorality. And those who distinguish between spirits recognize those people immediately. Third, they are able to know when Satan is communicating false information. Now, we are told that Satan masquerades as an angel of light. He comes like a sheep, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing so that he, he looks good on the outside. And he communicates false information through people who sound plausible at the moment at which they proclaim it. So, for example... If you'll come with me to 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. And then if we turn back to the Old Testament, it speaks about the lying prophets. Finally, 1 Kings 22, 21. Finally, a spirit came forward, stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. By what means, the Lord asked. I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouths of all the prophets, he said. You will succeed in enticing him, said the Lord. Go and do it. So now the Lord has put a lying spirit in the mouths of all these prophets of yours. The Lord has decreed disaster for you. And this is a prophet coming to one of the kings, warning him about the disaster. The king doesn't want to believe him. He believes all the other prophets that are lying about uh, what's going to happen. And what is true back then continues to be true today. There are those who speak lies about God, and they speak those lies as if they are truths, and they speak them with great, uh, with great rhetoric so that it sounds very plausible. And then if you go to 1 John 4, verse 1, listen to what John instructs us to do. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. Fourth, the ability to recognize those who are demonized or, if you like, who have been taken over by a demon. Now, we know through Scripture that those who dabble in uh, Satanism, those who dabble in witchcraft, those who put themselves in situations where supernatural powers are being called on, whether it's playing little games, that glassy glassy, or going to a horoscope person to get your horoscope, and it is a horoscope, um, it, it doesn't matter what level it occurs at, but you open yourself up to demons coming and taking over your life and controlling you. And those who are gifted in this are able to see where people have been demon-possessed and are involved in the helping of those to get rid of those demons through, again, primarily the proclamation of the gospel. 
I remember having encountered that myself. I remember uh, speaking to someone who is involved in this kind of a ministry, that they are engaged in, 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 in this particular area where they deal with those who have been demonized, those who have been controlled by demons, and they bring the word of God to them and help them to get rid of those demons. Now, how does that generally occur? What well, generally occurs, because Christians can't be demonized, they have the Holy Spirit in them, and so it's impossible for them to come under the control of a demon when they are already controlled by the Spirit. But it happens to unbelievers. And the way in which unbelievers are delivered out of that is through the gospel being presented, for only the gospel can deliver and save them. And as the gospel is de delivered by those who are gifted in this way, so the demon is then removed and the Holy Spirit comes into the person's life and takes over. So those are the way in which these three gifts work. Tongues, supernatural, gift, given to those to speak a known human language, interpretation of tongues that they don't know, interpretation of tongues, someone who is able to interpret tongues when it comes and bring that interpretation so the body is edified and then to distinguish it between spirits, those who are gifted to recognize that which comes from Satan directly and that which comes from God. So you need to ask yourself a question. And the way in which you, you discover whether or not you're gifted in that is not by going through a whole gift questionnaire, though that may be of some help, but to ask yourself, have you ever been in that situation where you have exercised that particular gift and seen the results of that gift in operation? And if the answer to that is yes, then can I say to you, then you are gifted with that particular gift. If the answer is no, it may be that God will gift you in that way sometime in the future, but it certainly means you don't have that gift in the present. Now, for those of you who perhaps have been led into thinking that tongues are some private prayer language, can I say to you that that's not the way it is presented in Scripture. It is always presented as a language that is understood and a language that is part of a human language somewhere, even though it may be unknown to the speaker. So can I encourage you? Because Paul says, desire, eagerly desire uh, the, the greater gifts, but it's not wrong for us to want to exercise spiritual gifts. It's not wrong for us to want to desire spiritual gifts. But notice how he ends this section. So important, he says, all these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and He gives them to each one just as He determines. So if I can end by this saying, you must accept that it is God's sovereign will to determine what gift He gives to you. Yes, you can desire certain gifts. It's not wrong. But you must always accept whatever gift God gives you. And you may step back and say, but I wanted that gift. God gives them as he sees fit for you and how he is best able to use you in his kingdom. So don't envy those who have gifts that you wish you had. Don't become jealous about those who have different gifts to you. Accept the gifts that God gives you. Use the gifts that God gives you. Get engaged in expressing those gifts, applying those gifts consistently. Because if the body of Christ is going to be built up, all the gifts need to be in operation. So can I encourage you to use the gifts that God has given you? Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this uh, time that we've been able to spend just going a little bit deeper in some of these gifts. I pray, Lord, for those in this church, you know who they are. You know the gifts that you have determined to give them, that you would help them to discern those gifts, to understand what spiritual gifts you have given them, to embrace those gifts, even if it's not the gifts they wish they could have had. And I pray that you would help them to use those gifts so that the body of Christ is edified, so that we as your people are built up, so that the common good is achieved as a result of their gifts. Help them, Lord Jesus, to learn and understand what their gifts are. And may you bless them as a result of using those gifts. For Jesus' sake, amen. Please enjoy your week, and I look forward to seeing you in person next week. God bless you.